Hi, this is Dr. Tom Rogers coming to you for the weekly podcast of the Common Sense MD. I've got a special guest who I've waited a long time for this, and I'm so happy to have you here today, Congresswoman Diana Harshbarger. Great to have you here today. Thank you. I know you're busy. We've talked many times about doing this. And actually, we may do a series of a couple of these things. So there's so many important things to do. But first of all, I'm going to give you kudos for being elected and re-elected in landslide <laughs> victories. And I even visited you this summer in Congress. You are very kind to host several of us in the halls of Congress, even the underground parts. And it was yeah, a wonderful fun, trip. Yeah. But um, I want to give you credit for something, too. I'm probably going to shock you here. But really, if it weren't for you and Bob, there's no way I would be I would have no. performance medicine. No. I mean, flat out, if it weren't for her and her husband, Bob, I would be retired long ago. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing my own thing for 17 years. And it's really wow. because of a few conversations I had with you guys about, well, being frustrated with medicine. Yeah. And I decided to give up the what I call corporate medicine model and just hang my own shingle which I did and at the time your small pharmacy yeah. in one room yeah. and wow. it's just not in the last 17 years yeah, it's just really years. grown like crazy but you really the reason I started talking to you guys is because of you who were an expert in bioidentical hormones for women yeah. And that's one of our main things that we do. Yeah. But you were the first one in this area that knew about bioidentical hormones at all. I know. They don't teach you that in school, Tom. They do not teach you. You yeah. have to learn it. Mm -hmm. And we ended up going to a lot of uh, conferences together. We actually did yeah. the fellowship in functional integrative functional medicine, medicine yeah. which is more focused on prevention and yeah. keeping you healthy and strong as you age. So yeah. certainly bioidentical hormones and weight loss those are the two things i started out in your small well, pharmacy at the time i remember are you kidding me that was 17 years ago lord no wonder i, I should be coming monthly for botox <laughs> for heaven's <laughs> sakes but <laughs> I, i'm so appreciative of you what you've done for me i mean not only our community and what you're doing for our country but really for me and my practice because it allowed me the space and the knowledge which I gained and it really spurred me to go ahead and go on and do the fellowship and my whole life changed because I did that yeah. and I'll never forget you and Bob talking to you in the parking lot one night on Eastman Road about maybe I'm getting out of traditional medicine yeah. and I'm getting into a more of a an integrative pattern on you know why do you have this disease not just being a yeah. prescription writer you know as a pharmacist yeah. Yeah. you're a pharmacist bob's a pharmacist yeah. and your son bobby yeah. who's and now on the board yeah. in in nashville yay thank yeah. god yeah. uh so it's a pharmacy it's a pharmacy family and yeah. so you know of the things yeah. that happen in, in the american healthcare system that is really kind of bad but oh, god yeah I want Terrible. to talk. I want to talk to you. And I want to fill you out on some of these things about what's happening with the medical system yeah. in our country, right. and then we're going to take another session and probably talk about um, compounding pharmacists. But because you and Bob were the first compounding pharmacist ever in this area, probably in Tennessee, maybe in the country. Yeah. Well, we did. A, we brought a lot of innovative things to this area, but you know, I, I always tell Bob. And Tom, you know it. And I, I want to say something about Dr. Rogers to the audience, too. Tom is a great physician, and that's why he is an even better functional medicine doctor and an alternative specialist, because you have to have a heart for the patient, because when we take an oath as a physician or a pharmacist, it's what? To do no harm. And he knew, he, he was smart enough to know that with corporate medicine, you have to bring them in. You may see 60 or 70 a day, but you have a quota to meet. When you are your own boss, you are treating the patient. What's your shirt say? I work for uh, patients. I work for patients, yeah, I not for insurance patients. companies. It's the same thing I did as a pharmacist. It's the same thing I'm doing up in Congress right now. I'm working for the people I serve. And it, there's no difference, you know, and it's this work ethic that we developed at the pharmacy and, and with you as the health care provider. When you have a basis and you work in the real world, it's it's like it gives you a totally different perspective when you go up to fight 
the government, basically, and what they want to do, Tom. I mean, listen, um, it didn't take much to talk you into anything. We just were not taught this when we go to medical school or pharmacy school about alternative medicine, functional medicine. And what we had to do is spend our own dollars to go out and learn to treat the whole patient to find instead of giving putting a Band-Aid on a problem, you're getting to the root of the problem. And so that's what you love. That's what I love. That's what all of us loved. And that's why we work so well together, Tom. Boy, We're no, working for the patient. No kidding. And, you know, through the bioidentical hormones and the, all the innovative things that you do with compounding that you cannot do otherwise yeah. it's just yeah. another level yeah. but i always admired you for taking the time to educate especially these women you you brought yeah. them through menopause <laughs> and yeah. i mean you were their life yeah. saver you know you really were for all these women and as we know because of the women's health initiative a lot of women as a matter of fact a whole generation of women got jaded on hormones well, did. doctors did too you taught doctors as well as patients and you spent the time with them yeah which we'll talk about in a little bit but yeah. on, on this first segment what is going on with our health care system i'm really frustrated mm -hmm. with it even being independent it's i still get affected by it because i you see do. what's happening with people yeah. i don't know whether we're headed towards socialized medicine which is a one-payer system you know with all these there's, as a physician, there are incentives for most doctors to write more prescriptions and to spend less time with a the patient. They actually get paid for performance, which means, and they, they measure performance yeah. with how many people you put on a statin, how many people you put yeah. on a diabetic medication. Not really the numbers that you get, yeah. but um, how, what, do you you think, what do you think is going to happen? Where are we headed? Well, universal health care you know and i was talking to somebody the other day because my specialty is pharmacy and i know what pharmacy benefit managers are doing and why you can't get what used to be on because it's not on the formulary and people don't understand we don't burden the patient with going through all the details as to why they can't get the medicine we just know we have to pick the phone up 90 percent of my time even when i was at practicing every day was spent going through a prior approval process or you know getting something changed to what was on the formulary calling the physicians up and saying well listen dr rogers that's not covered but this one is can we switch it and sometimes the patient went without medications for days and we never would allow them to go without medications but it, in order to get the full prescription it, it's terrible and if you look at it tom like i say i was up in dc I don't even know, uh, last week or the week before, and somebody said, you know, we're already on a vertical pathway to universal health care because do you own, I, I want to ask you this and, and your listeners, do you know who uh, employs more physicians than anybody else in the country? The government? United Healthcare. Because you have a vertical system of health care. You have the insurance company who owns the physician, they own the pharmacy, they own the pharmacy benefit manager. I mean, do you not think that's a, uh, a little bit of a conflict of interest when you own all those different modalities? To me, that's a silo of universal health care right there. If you want one payer system, that's what you've got with these insurance companies. It's very interesting that United Healthcare employs, employs more, physicians. more physicians than anybody in the country, and and that's a known fact. And I mean, the lobbyists know it, the 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 members know it. My job is to educate every member in Congress who I would work with in order to let them know what I have learned in 37 years of practice. Listen, I, I do want to tell you this. You have people in Washington, D.C. creating laws and legislation who, for a specific sector of a profession that have never worked in that profession. Do you think that's a good thing? Well, I don't see that that's a good thing because if you haven't worked that arena, you know, if I, you're expected to know a little bit about everything. And do I know everything? No, but I know who to go to to get the answers, and I go to the experts to get those answers. They come to me about pharmacy issues or health care issues, and I'll say, well, it worked this way when, when I was practicing. I still hold my license in every state that I was licensed in. I won't let that lapse because what I'm doing is a service to the people I serve. It's not a lifetime 
You should never, you should be a citizen legislator and go to Congress and take your profession, make it better, and then guess what? Come back home and practice. I love, it. I that's, love that's that what attitude. That's what we need with everybody. You yeah. mean to tell me you've met a few career politicians up there? Son of a gun. I've had a few <laughs> pass away in office. I, I mean, what the heck, Tom? It's pretty sad. They talk you know, about term limits. I saw, a, I saw a joke in one of the magazines the other day. It was a family that was hovering over the hospital bed of their old loved one, an old yeah. man. And they, they said they were faced with, there's two ways we could do this. Either we're going to have to put you in a nursing home or we're going to run you for senator. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, you know, I was looking. Somebody, Dolly Parton did the halftime show for the Cowboys last yep. night, Dallas Cowboys. And somebody was uh, on signal, and they're like, well, dang, she looked good. And they said, Dolly for president. I said, well, she's in the 77. She's right in the she's right in age, <laughs> for God's sakes. You don't have too many criteria, but heavens. You know, you were talking about the pharmacy benefit managers, which mm -hmm. I have a personal vendetta against because I read in the Wall Street Journal that, you know, the new drug Ozempic, which we yeah. use for a lot of reasons, yeah. weight loss as well as diabetes. But yeah. in any event, the PBMs make 62% of the profit off every Ozempic pen sold, and they're owned by CVS. Yeah, so it's totally. a monopoly. It should be illegal. Listen, Can't you guys get something done about well, that? Well, are you don't think you have you watched any of my uh, committee hearings or my knockdown dragouts? I'll yeah. just burn you on. Here. Yeah. Oh, baby. You know, it's like I tell them. They see me coming down the hall. Some of the lobbyists do, and if they work for the PBM, they just turn around and walk the other way. I'm like, what's wrong? They're like, she doesn't like me. I said, I like you fine. It's just I do not like your company. I said, I have no vendetta against you, and, and this is the issue. You've got a pharmacy owning a pharmacy benefit manager, and why the FTC allowed that to happen many years ago, we screamed and, and yelled and everything independent pharmacists did, but what happened? They allowed the merger to go, to go on. And I'm like, if the Federal Trade Commission says it's not a good idea because what will happen, healthcare will become more expensive, and the, uh, the ultimate uh, outcome is the patient will get less care that was their warning years ago. And what has happened? The very thing they said would happen. The patient's getting less care and health care is more expensive. Duh. I mean, that's one time they, they may have been right. But honestly, it's a conflict of interest. Now they own the physicians. And I don't see a stopping point. And, you know, people... Why do we even have insurance? It's for catastrophic emergencies, yeah. Agreed. honestly. Agreed. Because when I come to you, I pay cash. When I go to the pharmacy, I pay cash. I mean, I told them, I said, if you're not, and this is when cheaper that way. Senator Cassidy and Senator Marshall came over, and, and Cassidy's working with Bernie Sanders because you have to be bipartisan over in the Senate. I don't, I don't know about that Senate. But, you know, and what they have is they're trying to control pharmacy benefit managers. And I, I didn't. That it was at the doctor's caucus because I am a member of the doctor's caucus. There's just two pharmacists in Congress. And we were sitting there, and I was listening to him explain this new legislation to getting ready to roll out about pharmacy benefit managers. And I'm like, the doctors were looking at me like, do you understand this? And, I, and I'm like, and when the senators couldn't explain it, and I didn't understand it, there's a problem because this is my area of expertise. But that goes back to what I said. You're listening to too many voices, and it's people who haven't worked the profession, you know. I told them, I said, with any legislation you create, don't make it a calculus problem. Make it simple addition where the American people can understand. Yeah, they've made it so convoluted, and it's so bought out. Follow the money. Follow and the money. you have people always, there's such a huge health care spending that we do. And yet we're 33 on the mortality list among you know, developed I have nations. A deck counter now that Thomas Massey from Kentucky made me, and you you sync it up every morning to the U.S. Treasury, and it shows you what the debt is. It's seven thousand two hundred a month ago. It was over seven thousand a second. That's our wow. debt. And listen, um, going back to your question about uh, the formulary, like Ozempic. Look, it's a pay-to-play. If these manufacturers, you know, when Big Pharma is screaming that uh, about the pharmacy benefit managers, there's an issue. So it's a pay-to-play. If you want your drug on a formulary, then you have to give rebates. And this is one of the questions that we are trying to find out. And I'll tell you how critical it is. Uh, now the FTC is looking into pharmacy benefit managers. 
And initially, they decided, well, they voted. You've got four commissioners, and then you've got the head of the commission, the FTC. Well, they were still waiting on her to be confirmed. So um, two of the commissioners voted not to delve into it. Two of them said yes. But it was the two Republicans. I'm like, okay, this is bipartisan. Why is it? He said it's not broad enough, and they haven't given us enough time to look at it. I said, allow me and Buddy Carter out of Georgia to help you with the questions on the front end. Let's load you up with the correct questions to ask. Then you can start your investigation is what it's called. It's, it's an investigation. So I, I can assure you of this. They're in the middle of investigating pharmacy benefit managers, and they've never had the pushback. in the con, Since the conception of the FTC, they've never had as much pushback from any agency that they have investigated then they have the pharmacy benefit managers because it is a shell game and nobody can track the money. And you wonder why your medications are expensive or why you can't get this, but you can get that. That's why, because it was born out of, of big pharma's, um, you know, the pharmacy benefit managers were uh, created when big pharma said, oh, well, we need some help. You know, we need to know what to put on formulas. Now, think about it this way. The babies have grown up and now they're smacking their parents around. That's what the pharmacy benefit managers have all grown up now. And now they are telling the pharmacy, ben I mean, the big pharma what to do and what they'll cover and what they want. That's why you, you either get a, a Zimpig or you got to jump through hoops. We've got legislation about prior approvals because now the doctor's caucus, and we should be the ones creating health care legislation. Agreed. shouldn't be anybody else. It should be us saying, you know, the th fit physician reimbursement is horrific these people yeah. can't continue to own a practice that's why they're selling practices out to hospitals or to insurance companies i they read that in the wall street business. journal today how many physicians are having to sell their practices because medicaid and medicare reimbursement so bad well, cms they need to be restructured top to bottom and i told them i raised my hand and i said if it's got three or four letters i'm available to restructure the fda cms nih cdc you name it, we'll throw down. OSHA, that's another one, OSHA. <laughs> you know, you could be famous. You already are kind of famous, but you could really be famous if you took that one crusade on and you could straighten this whole mess out because I'm afraid that we're really headed towards socialized medicine. Now, my father was a doctor, as you know. Mm -hmm. I heard him talking about socialized medicine back in the 60s, how he thought it would come someday and how he dreaded it because, you know, government mm -hmm. should not, run health care basically well, think about it this way you've got insurance companies tom that are practicing medicine without a license they're telling you what you got to do for your right. patient what you can't do that's why you left 17 years ago and it is no better it is Force. much worse it's, now it's a ton worse and if you live in a rural area like we do these people have to drive and then if it's not covered or they can't get a prior approval for some kind of surgery I mean, you know what I had to do the other day, and I'm still furious about this. There is, you know, the Stark Law where you can't do the, the referrals. Uh, physicians are held to, to that practice. And, uh, I mean, to that standard of where you – and I understand the Stark Law. You can't prescribe and make money off of it, you know. Yeah, yeah. But what happened is it grabbed the um, oncologist, the urologist, anybody treating cancer per se – do you know that oncologists were mailing like oral cancer therapies to their patients? Well, now that the pandemic is officially over because we forced Biden to sign the paperwork that said it, they cannot do that anymore. The patient has to physically drive to pick their medication up. Do you know what a burden that wow. is when you're sick? The family can't come and pick it up. Unbelievable. You can't mail it. They have to physically come in to pick that medication up. It's And I have a, a bill that says... You know, make that provision with Stark Law permanent that, you know, you can mail to these sick, very sick patients. And they will not take it up. CMS has to look at it and score it and all that. I said, it doesn't cost them a dime. The doctor is paying to mail it. It is ridiculous, ridiculous, ridiculous that we would even have to spend our time legislating something as, as crazy as that. And what do you think the outcomes are going to be for these patients? If they can't get there, they miss a dose. If they do a third-party pharmacy benefit manager, which is what they're aiming to do, they want to force you to do mail order. If they don't get it in time, the doctor may not know. Uh, the patient may say, well, you know, I hadn't had my medications in three weeks. And that will change the total outcome of that chemotherapy regimen. Sure sure so 
and I've tried to explain to these people, I'm like, are you kidding me? So I've asked to talk to the head of CMS. And, you know, oncologists are up in arms. We have a lot of support for this. Both sides, it's bipartisan support because it is ridiculous. These are some of the issues that just burn your hide. And you're like, can you be that stupid? And I, I don't use that word in front of my grandsons, by the way. I just say silly. But this is pure stupid, okay? That yeah. they know it and they do it anyway. That's a definition. There's so many hoops and things you have to jump through to get a patient something. Even for practice like mine, which yes. I'm cash only, we still have to go through all the hoops to get somebody an X-ray or a medicine yeah. approved through a PA. But if they would just make it simple, let us do it, our job. We wouldn't. We wouldn't have all How these. How much hoops. time do you even now spend on paperwork? I mean, reconciliation for me, or making sure that. I mean, that's a whole other situation with clawbacks and DIR fees for the pharmacy part. And uh, look, they want, they're they forcing us to do mail order everything. You I know, mean, I th that's what they want these people that's listening to this to do. They want you to do that. You know, I think the whole point of this thing and the whole focus, if you're – if you can slightly understand what we're talking about here. And again, unless you practice or in a pharmacy every day or at a doctor's office, mm -hmm. you don't understand the extent to which it goes. I mean, it's just unbelievable what you have to go through to see a patient even or to get a medication for them. Mm -hmm. So the bottom line to me is, and I focus my whole practice on it, is keep yourself healthy. I think we live in a time yeah. when... We prescribe too many medications. We don't focus oh. on yeah. fitness, nutrition, sleep, relationships. We're a pill-oriented society. I'm sure it's you saw easy. that as a pharmacist, people coming in all day for things they don't need. Well, they would if they were on 20 meds per se, you know, and I would reassess them. But some people had a shopping bag full of medications, and they're like, can you put all that in one pill? I said, honey, I could, but it'd be about a triple quadruple ought and I said would have to shoot it down your throat with the horse um, <laughs> you know blower so but the bottom line is this preventative and they don't want to cover preventative health Tom no I mean no. we're trying to force them to incentivize these um, you know health care groups or these physician groups to uh, why don't you focus on preventative health you know why don't you but Remember, I'm also after uh, big pharma on use patents too about extending these generics and let them come up. Yeah. There's yeah. just a whole world of things I want to do that need to be directed and uh, just so you're, everybody will know. I sit on energy and commerce and they have jurisdiction over health care. They have jurisdiction. I'm on the health subcommittee. I'm also on the health uh, subcommittee on commerce um, and also on t uh, telecom. We have jurisdiction on so many things. Social media, telehealth. Telehealth's here to stay. We have to make sure the regulations are in the 21st century yeah, yeah. so you can practice across state lines. And we've uh, pushed that forward about two years, like through the pandemic. Oh, really? okay. But we're going to have to legislate uh, to make sure you can still do telehealth and not have, have the government have coming after you. Yeah, because, oh, example, it's, it's, I treat since the pandemic, yeah. you know, because we treated COVID. I have patients from all over the country, yeah. and I'm worried that I'm going to have to now go get a license in every state for well, those people will. in California to do telemedicine with me. You will, because if these states have already passed legislation, it's the more stringent of the two, but you'll have to abide and be licensed in California. Right now, you can still do that because we pushed that out. How long, how long have you pushed it out? Well, it was uh, extended for two years. I think that was – I'd have to go back Does to the beginning Does that run out date. next year? It, it will. That's why we're trying to – you know, get the regs and, and everything set up for, you know, telehealth. I hope you're successful. That's yeah. major. That really needs well, to be done. Well, it is because, look, you, you got, look, we have a shortage of physicians. We, we have a do. shortage of nurses. We have a shortage of everybody. They're looking to, in some states I heard the other day, they're, they're talking about letting PAs and, uh, well, we know nurse practitioners can practice autonomously without, you know, overseen, yeah. being overseen by a uh, physician, but they're looking at PAs and uh, who else was it? I can't even remember. And I'm thinking, you know, we need qualified people. I mean, I'm pushing everything I can to, even DOs couldn't get residencies 
over MDs. And I mean, my God above, I don't care what they got behind their name. Let them have good residencies if they're capable and competent Agreed. to where they can practice and be uh, the kind of health care provider we need. You know, one out of every five health care providers quit during or after the pandemic. That left us with a huge shortage. Well, you know what I tell people? It's like good docs, just kind of like you left the corporate medicine to do your own thing. They were in the middle of the stream. It's people our age, you know, we're stri- we're crossing the river and we're in the middle of the stream. It's like, do I want to swim to the other side and get out of this business? But the younger guys, they're what, 300000 in debt just to get out of school. They're like, I can't go to the other side. i got to swim back and be in this mess. And what they're doing, to the- that's another thing, too. When I was on Ed and Labor last year, and now I know the criteria they're using to get people into medical school and how they're siloing them now due to color. This is, they're setting us back to uh, the middle ages, basically. It is in in diversity, equity, inclusion. I told them, this is my joke. You want me to tell a joke? When they kept sending me emails about DEI, and look, I don't discriminate against anybody for the record, but they said, are you ever going to open those emails? I said, well, no, I know what you're going to tell me, and I don't have to worry about that. And I said, you know where I come from, what DEI stands for? They're like, what? And I said, Dale Hearn Hart Incorporated. <laughs> and uh, they never sent me another email, just <laughs> FYI. So I think it might That's be right. I never thought about that. <laughs> totally. That's, I've learned something. what you can here. use that. That See, is look, awesome. Back in my neck of the woods, yeah. Well, you're fighting for health care in our country to become better, which it needs mm-hmm. to be. I mean, the last two years – we actually have longevity is going down. Life expectancy is declining yeah. in our country for mm-hmm. the first time ever the past few years. And yet we've got a medical system that can cure. I mean, they can operate in utero. We can do Think so many that. unbelievable things. And yet the average person can't get decent health care because they don't know how to take care of themselves. Well. You know, when they passed that Inflation Reduction Act, it had a little caveat to where the government could uh, negotiate the price of your drugs. Does anybody think that it's a good idea to let the government negotiate the price on anything? I We're $33.6 trillion in debt. And what that did, though, with the new biotech companies, the, the, all the new cures and, and what they're doing with, um, you know, just – so many diseases like rare and ultra rare diseases that's going to set that back there's not going to be money for that and they are on the cutting edge of getting some of these uh, biotech companies up and running and you're just going to stifle their growth and i'm like oh my god that is one thing we have to reverse when we get a new president and i pray or jesus that we do because it's not been good for the healthcare industry and you know let's go back to the vaccines i don't even want to open that can of worms but man oh man what i have learned you have no idea I bet. one day i'm going to come out with what i really think happened during covid if yeah, i did that before and i did do a lot of that i got censored every time censorship is real censorship I mean, I- is real i'm on the committee that says it is <laughs> you should have seen it when we i gotta say this too we had the CEO of TikTok come before our committee, and I, I want you to know this. I'm like, Lord, I walked down the halls. They had called everybody that was an influencer that would fly in to try to influence us to vote uh, uh, against censorship of, of TikTok. I mean, to, to vote to get rid of it. We have to decide whether we're going to keep it or not. And they had flown everybody up to D.C. to intimidate us. Of course, it didn't intimidate me, but when I walked down the hall to go into the committee room, I'm like, Lord, I've never seen so many cameras. It's like walking on a set of Yellowstone. I'm like, what is going on? But it was massive. It was a bipartisan beatdown against that one uh, social media. And I know people love it, but they are, it's an absolute spot. That's exactly how China knows what 150 million Americans are doing. They're spying on everybody using that app. Just saying if you have children young children or if you're on it get off get just get off Agreed. And it's that's ruining my, our kids i think oh well that's a, that's a whole nother episode tom about yep. what social yep. media is doing but we do have the authority under uh my subcommittees and we will be making a decision on that as well as the federal privacy you mean you right? actually think it's the parents that should be telling the kids their kids what to do i got a whole scenario about what <laughs> we need to do to fix this country if people want to listen it'll take a it'll be a longer podcast than this one son <laughs> well thank god you are in washington it's so refreshing 
to hear somebody like you that's fighting. And again, you're, you're I know you very well, and I know that you don't care what anybody thinks about you no, up there. No. You're up there just to to do the right thing. I mean, yes. it's pretty simple, really. When you when you good versus bad, right versus mm-hmm. wrong. You know, don't make it complicated. Just do the right thing. Yes. What you're doing, and we're so proud of you. We're going to have another conversation with you very soon. Okay. Maybe next week. But okay. uh, thank you so much for coming on oh. here with us. Go back to Washington. It's like Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Jimmy yeah. Stewart, remember that movie? Yeah. You know, that's what you remind me of. Oh, gosh. Fun. Common sense, you mean? This is your podcast. A I'm real like- person, a real business owner, doctor of pharmacy up in Washington. Yeah. You know, that's kind of refreshing. Well, it, it is. It is, Tom. Well, thank you so much for doing what you do. Thank you for what you've mm-hmm. done for me. Thank you for coming on the show today. Yeah. I look forward to another podcast very soon. Yeah. Well, I want to say bye. Just know I'm on the job. No matter if I'm sitting here with Tom or I'm up in D.C., I'm working for you. So please um, let Tom know if you have questions or you can contact me directly as well. Thank you, Dana. We'll see You're you welcome. guys next week. Okay.